Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to go verses 1 to 7. Paul writes, As for you, You were dead in transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Next week, I really look forward to finishing out that chapter. But there is so much in this passage that I did not think it would be right if we could go all the way to verse 10. There's so much there. So this morning, sort of breaking up this part into two parts. And this morning, I just want to catch you up because Paul is writing a letter to the church in Ephesus. And the church in Ephesus is supposed to sit down and read this whole letter all at once. And we, in our day and age, we... We have a short attention span. We just like to chop it up into little chapters and eat it bit by bit. And so I want to make sure that we're keeping track of the larger picture that Paul's painting for us. You remember that in chapter 1 that God had chosen us for salvation before the foundation of the world. So before the world was ever created, he knew you, he chose you, and that was not according to any foreknown faith or any knowledge that you would choose him any great quality that you had, but he did that in love. He predestined you before the foundation of the world because of his great mercy. And that in choosing you, he adopted you as sons and daughters. And he did not adopt us as slaves or someone just to work in his vineyard, but he adopted us as sons and daughters. In that form of adoption, we receive an inheritance. We inherit eternal life. And because of all that, because of his great love, he not only adopted us, chose us, gave us an inheritance, but he sealed us for the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit so that our election would be sure, that our inheritance would be secure. And so now, because of all that, in the last part of chapter 1, he wanted to tell us that because we have been made alive in Christ Jesus, the same power that makes us alive is at work within us. The same power that rose Jesus from the dead is at work within you. Uh, So therefore you can live a transformed life now. It's not just the hope for eternity. It's the power to live in the now in a new way. And so we're beginning where Paul left off. And I want to start our time with a story this morning. When I first moved to Stephenville and I started pastoring, I remember one of the first couples I got to go visit was Owen and Janet Sieverda. And they graciously invited me out to coffee. And I, uh, I remember, just as anyone who would do this, if going to a place where you've never been before, what do you do? You pull out your smartphone, you type in the address, and you, and you click, you know, click, give me the directions. Guide me, oh great, Google. <laughs> well, Google sent me to um, Lingleville Road from the Parsonage, and I drove out to Lingleville, and I made a left, and I passed by the high school, and I could see on the map I was getting close. Okay, I was going to make it right on time. Perfect. And I'm going down one of the S curves, and Google gives me the familiar, you have arrived at your destination. And I'm looking around, and I do not see my destination. In fact, as I was traveling along, I took a look at the address, and I noticed that none of the mailbox's addresses really seemed to match. And I thought, well, something's wrong here. Uh, Surely Google's not wrong. Did I make a mistake? I thought, oh, it's it's probably, it's one of these rural communities. I got to go a little farther and find the driveway, you know? And so I travel a few miles down the road. Addresses are just going astronomical numbers. I have no idea where I'm at. I do a U-turn on an S-curve, which I don't encourage. It's dangerous. I head back the other direction. 
I'm lost. Am I on the right road? Am I going the right way? Eventually, you know, out of stubbornness, I, I spent probably 30 minutes looking for this address. 30 more minutes than I should have. I stopped, and I had to phone the homeowner, and I said, Janet, I remember the conversation today. I said, I'm, I'm in this weird S-curve, and this is how I got there, and she says, you're in the wrong city. You're not even in the wrong, <laughs> you're not even in the right city. Uh, so um, this story has a happy ending. Though I was confidently driving down the wrong road. I was headed in the wrong direction. And every moment I was so pleasantly driving towards her house, I was getting lost. And thankfully, I have a, there was a gracious host. I arrived at my destination about 45 minutes later, and she still served me warm coffee. But I think this story sort of serves a point that Paul is actually trying to make this morning in our text. We live in a world where people are naturally and confidently driving down the wrong path, thinking that they're just going to end up at the right destination, but they're headed in the wrong direction. People are so quick to point out in our culture that this path is well-traveled. The roads are well-kept. After all, a billion people can't be wrong, right? That's what we call a fallacy of the masses. It's right because everybody's doing it. That's wrong. Lately in our culture, we have people who are saying this ad nauseum. Follow your heart. Anyone ever hear anyone say that? Anyone willing to admit that they've said it themselves once or twice, maybe? Well, the problem is, don't they ever think that their heart could be deceived? That their heart is not trustworthy? That it doesn't give good directions when it comes to life's journey? Like we trust Google because we, it's time tested, right? We think it cannot be wrong. Well, it's the same thing we do with our heart. We feel like we've time tested this. We feel like it cannot be wrong. But actually our heart needs to be challenged at every step that every step you walk down in life and your heart is telling you to do something, you should ask yourself, is that right? Is that really what I should be doing according to what God is calling me to do, what according to God's word says? I think people's default mode is to do what their natural tendencies would tell them to do. People will oftentimes say, this is the way God has created me. Therefore, it must be right because it, what's what comes natural to me. Incorrect, okay? Incorrect. I will confess something to you this morning that in my natural state, if I did not submit myself to God's word, I naturally would like to have many, many partners. But because God's word tells me that that's wrong, I do not let myself go into my natural tendency. I have to deny myself because that would be destruction and ruin. All of us have natural tendencies that we need to say, I am not following my heart on this. I am not doing what I think I should do, or what I feel like I should do, which would be good for me to do in my heart. I'm going to do what God's word tells me to do. And that's just what we need because your heart will naturally put you on a journey, a path to disaster and ruin and judgment. So we can't trust it. You know, whenever you remark this fact to somebody, you're very likely in our culture to get a stiff finger in your chest and say, how dare you? How dare you tell me that what I'm doing or my life trajectory is wrong? Who gives you the right? How dare we suggest that their life is going to lead them into ruin and destruction? But the truth is this morning, and what Paul wants to teach us is, we need something so much more concrete than our heart. We need something much more than what the animals have, which is natural desires. We need something that will stand, that's less whimsical, that's less flippy floppy. 
We need something strong like God's word. And when we open up his word, this is what we read. Chapter two, verse one. He says, as for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. We were dead in our transgressions and sins when we used to follow the ways of the world. Let me summarize this for you, what Paul says in chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. He says this. He says, originally, you are dead born. You were born dead spiritually. Because of that, you naturally follow the evil ways of this world. And Satan himself was encouraging this behavior. And he wants you to stay on the wrong path your whole life. That's what Paul says. We were born dead, Paul says. <laughs> say that to somebody, you'll get some weird looks. Go up to some stranger this week and say, you know what, you were born dead. Okay, you're crazy. What's wrong with you? You're crazy. Paul uses the word dead because it's not that people are just unaware spiritually or sort of sick or... Um, kind of sleeping spiritually. No, but he means that they're dead spiritually. Just as a dead person is unresponsive, so too we are naturally dead spiritually. And that's why he even repeats that in verse 5. He says dead. That means that we naturally need a miracle. We naturally need a miracle. We naturally need resurrection from the dead. Good news then, right? Because we just actually learned in chapter one that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is alive in us. And in fact, it has resurrected our spirits from the dead. How else do we think that we've been made spiritually alive? It's none other than the miracle of resurrection power that's already alive in us, at work in us. And you know what that means for us this morning? For us, there's not one single inch, not a square inch of room for us to boast in ourselves, to boast or sneer at those who are wandering lost in the world, who are following their heart, because we were them. We were them. We of all people will have to have that deep compassion for the lost. We have to have grace and mercy for the lost and love for our fellow humanity because we were them just a minute ago. And I think that's what means when Paul means when he says in verse 3, he says, All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. That was our natural place. You know, we deserve wrath just as much as anyone else. We deserve judgment just as much as anyone else. If we were not rescued by God in his sovereignty, if his power in Christ that didn't resurrect our spirits, we would be them. So for us, there's no way we can ever point a finger because we are those people, if not for the grace of God. In verse 4, Paul writes, Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ when we are dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. You know, the only conceivable answer to the problem for which we faced, which is spiritual deadness, the only conceivable solution is also the place for which would be the most unlikely answer would come. Let me explain. The one in whom we have offended in sinning, the one whose honor is offended, is also the one who would have to rescue us. And so the one who declares the judgment has to be the one who saves us. And so it seems like naturally you would think the one whom you hurt would not suddenly rescue you. The one whom we hated and offended, why would that one want to rescue us? But the amazing thing is he has done just that. The one whom we hated and offended has rescued us. The text says it was because of his great love for us. 
it's, that's really crazy because you have to recognize that his love for us came before we ever did anything for him, reciprocated any of that love. Imagine loving something that's completely against you and hatred towards you. And then keep loving them until you rescue them and then finally you receive love in return. You certainly wouldn't do it for the love. But because of love, he did it. Wow. Now that old hymn, amazing love, how can it be? And then finally, Paul writes in verse six, he says, God raised us up with Christ and seated him with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Okay, notice the tense here in this passage, in this verse specifically. He says, notice that he raised us up with Christ and seated us with Christ in the heavenly realms. Is this some crazy twilight zone stuff? Wait, what? He raised us with Christ and seated us? Seated us so right now we're spiritually seated with Christ in the heavenlies? Wow, that's some weird stuff. What does it mean that I've already been seated with Christ in the heavenlies? This is pretty, it's pretty cool. It's, it's a spiritual reality, okay? It's that we've, since Christ, we're in Christ, we've already been spiritually raised and seated with Christ. It's already done deal. We're already there spiritually. It's just like in Adam and Eve. You remember in the beginning when God warned Adam and Eve, he said, if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. You remember this. And then when they ate of the fruit, they went on living, right? And they even had more kids. So was God wrong? No, the moment that that fruit touched their lips, they died spiritually. And that was a spiritual reality. They no longer had that same fellowship with God. And so too in Christ, the exact opposite has taken place. When we go into Christ, he resurrects our spirits so that now we are alive in Christ spiritually, though our body hasn't yet been raised. So we're still living in this body of death while we have been made spiritually alive. That's pretty cool. Okay, so now what's the point that Paul's getting at in all of this? What's the application? Is Paul just trying to teach theology? Is he just trying to tell us in the church in Ephesus the theology of salvation? Or is there something that we can kind of take away or something we can ask of ourselves from this text? I think there is. Because I think that everything that Paul is telling the church in Ephesus is in order to make them feel something and more to cause them to live differently. The trouble is that we live in a world of people who are confidently walking in the wrong direction, confidently journeying down the wrong path. And they're going down that wrong road into ruin. And that alone is a problem, but far worse, so it seems, is that Christians begin to journey along with them, believing that that road's okay too because it's well-traveled. I think we, along with the church in Ephesus, are the people that are being reminded, don't follow the world's ways. Don't journey along the world's path. They are journeying to ruin and destruction. That path may be wide. The road may be well kept, but it is going in the wrong direction. The Christian's journey is down a narrow road. It's winding and it's tough. And there's burrs and weeds and wild animals at every turn. That is the right direction. And that is the path that you go with God on. I think the danger is that we can, we can feel safe with God because we understand salvation is a gift by grace. So we can feel safe with God that he has rescued us. We're spiritually alive in Christ Jesus. And then we can say, well, it doesn't matter what to do. It doesn't matter if I journey down the broad way or if I journey down the narrow way. It doesn't matter what path I take because eventually God will catch me 
and bring me into eternity into his loving arms. I actually think that that is a really dangerous way of thinking about this story of salvation. Can you walk down the wrong path and in the end be saved? Can you spend your whole life walking away from God, doing nothing about what he says, and in the end still be saved? Look, I'm going to say, I guess it's possible. With all things, God, God through with all things is possible, you know. God can do it, probably. But let me just warn you. If you wander down the wrong path your whole life, If you have zero concern for God, if you have zero concern for his ways, it might be possible that you are not saved. It may be possible that if you don't have any love for God, that your heart has absolutely deceived you into believing that you are one of God's chosen, that you are okay in Christ. That is a dangerous, really dangerous place to be. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Jesus also said, no one who says to me, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So, The warning is don't fool around on the wrong path, self-deceiving, feeling like I'm okay, I can live however I want because I'm saved by grace alone through faith. Don't deceive yourself thinking that I have faith when really your faith is made known by your works. If you do not have works, James would say you do not have faith. I would be remiss if I was not telling you this because I would hate to have somebody wander down the wrong path all their life and then get to glory and have to, to, to figure out, in fact, that they are not in Christ. That would be so sad. Paul says to the church in Philippi, he says to them, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That doesn't mean you work for your salvation. That just means that you know that you're keeping the works of repentance, that your heart is right. You're challenging your heart at every step. So this morning, what if, you know, what if, I know at times in my life I've been wandering down the wrong path. What if that's you this morning? What do you do? If you feel like you've had assurance of salvation, but you know in your heart, man, I've been wandering. I've been down the wrong road and I haven't cared enough to get back on the right one. Well, I think we go back to John's message, John the Baptist. What he would say to us this morning is simply repent and believe. Turn from your wicked ways and believe in Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There's no question. You can have the assurance of salvation by repenting and believing. You know, some of you, is anyone here good at math in here? Anyone say, oh, I'm pretty good at math. Marley is. All right. One good math person. Well, good news, right, is if, I, if, I'm, if you study math, you get to basic math, but then eventually you get to uh, algebra, you get to calculus, you get to physics, you get to all of these equations that are highly complicated that require multiple steps to solve the, the problem. Well, if you know math, you know that if you make a wrong move, you actually start down a wrong path way, and you cannot get to the right answer unless you go back and you correct the mistake. If you go back and get on the right on the right path. And so it is with Christianity. God would not have his people be rescued, made spiritually alive, only to turn to him obstinately and say, no, thank you to your way. I'm going my own way. We have to repent. We have to go back and we have to write that. And then we go on and live in the light of the gospel. The truth is, is that none of us will ever live this life perfectly. 
None of us will ever walk the way that God has called us to walk because we live within a body of death, a body that is given over to sin. But God calls us to repent from that sin at every turn and make war with our body every time it will tell us to do something that is against his way. So I'm calling us this morning, each and every one of us, to make war with the natural desires of our body. Let's make war. Amen? Okay. Lord God, this, this morning, uh, we have a, just an enlightening text, a challenging text. Lord, we pray that by your spirit, you would cause us to be alive to the deception that we all fall into, the desires of our own hearts to wander and to fall into sin because we love it. So, because our body loves it and craves it. Lord, I pray by your spirit that you would cause us to make war with the desires within us, the ones that would drag us away from you, the ones that would drag us away from your ways. And I pray that we might find life in the name of Jesus and find it abundantly. And I pray that you would assure us of our salvation, knowing that we are in Christ, not because of what we do, but we're reminded because we love you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the forgiveness in him. It's in his name we pray. Amen.